<laughs> hey, good afternoon. I'm uh, Colonel Greg Penfield. I'm the title-wise Vice Provost for Learning Systems. That's when I talk outside the military. Inside, it just means director. That's just to align with the academia here at Army University. And I'm doing the keynote address, which is code for the major introduction of truly the guest speaker. That's what that boils down to. We're happy to have you here, Anya. So the uh, Cultural Re Regional Expertise and Language Management Office, under the able leadership of this guy, Dr. Ibramhoff, has established a very robust program of panel discussions and presentations that focus on topics of strategic importance to the U.S. national security objectives, all with regional and global geopolit geopolitical uh, considerations. For example, if you're here at our last presentation, they highlight a summary of the forthcoming anthology, The Future of Eurasia, Cultural Perspectives, Geopolitics, and Ener Energy Security of Eurasia is the next global war imminent. Well, today's presentation, Russia's Policy in the Middle East, What is Next, continues this thematic approach with clear regional and geopolitical implications affecting our national security. Russia's involvement in the current Syrian conflict and their close ties with Iran are complicating U.S. foreign policy efforts in the Middle East. Noteworthy for today's topic is that it is also the Russian holiday known as the Day of the Defender of the Motherland. So for uh, more mature generations who live this, Fayo, Mark Wilcox et al., right? It's known also as the Day of the Soviet Army, all right? Bef before it was the Krasnovians, right? It was the Soviet. So Dr. Ibramhoff will uh, show two videos that highlight the patriotic fever, fervor that is associated with this particular holiday and set the stage for our discussion today. So with that as a background, it's my distinct privilege to introduce our guest speaker, Ms. Anya Borshevskaya. Ms. Borshevskaya is the Ira Weiner Fellow at the Washington Institute, focusing on Russia's policy toward the Middle East. She is also a fellow at the European Foundation for Democracy and was previously with the Peterson Institute for International Econo Economics and the Atlantic Council. She's a former analyst for a U.S. military contractor in Afghanistan, and she also served as the communications director for the American Islamic Congress. Her analysis is published widely in several journal journals, such as the New Criterion, Turkish uh, Policy Quarterly, and the Middle East Quarterly. She also conducts translation and analysis for the U.S. Army's Foreign Military Studies Office that's here at Fort Leavenworth and its flagship publication, Operational Environment Watch. Anya regularly writes for a foreign affairs column for Forbes, among other publications, and is the author of a recent monograph entitled Russia in the Middle East, Motives, Consequences, and Prospects. So after her initial remarks, Ms. Borshevskaya, Anya, will answer any questions you may have, facilitated by Dr. I. So with that, Dr. I, it's all yours. Go. <clears throat> thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for this very timely discussion. So uh, as Colonel Penfield indicated, we want to show you a couple of videos two minutes each. And uh, as indicated, today is the day of the defense of the motherland, formerly the day of the Soviet Army. Uh, please pay attention in the first video to the reaction of the audience. You will see different generation, children, younger people, older people, military civilians. Um, but the reaction would be the same because the, the song which is played, usually played today, and that's appealing to the patriotic feelings of Russians. The second video uh, with the same song, but uh, demonstrating mainly the military capabilities. The, the message is the same, appealing to the patriotic feelings. We have discussed before this Russian strategic military culture, the so-called concept of Eurasianism based on the tragic past like Great Patriotic War, for example, etc., which essentially shaped the Russian mindset. That, to a, certain uh, to, to a certain extent, explains the sensitivity of Russia, for example, towards NATO's expansion. So again, as you all know, 
ancient Russian strategist concept, understand your adversary, step in the shoes of your adversary, understand its history, culture, sociocultural considerations. With that, I would like to show, we would like to begin with the first video and to answer your possible questions. Please. Понатянутым нервом я кордами веры эту песню пою тем, кто бросив карьеру живота не жалея свою грудь подставляет за Россию свою тем, кто выжил в Афгане. Свою честь не изгадив, кто карьеры не делал, от солдатских кровей я пою офицерам, матерей пожалевшим, возвратив им обратно живых сыновей. Офицеры, офицеры, ваше сердце под прицелом За Россию и свободу до конца Офицеры, россияне, пусть свобода вас сияет Заставляя в унисон звучать сердца Господа офицеры, как сберечь вашу веру На разрытых могилах ваши души хрипят Что ж мы, братцы, наделали, не смогли уберечь их И теперь они вечно в глаза нам глядят so, this is the first video. Any questions before we go to the second video? Going to be the same song, by the way, just a summary, quick summary of the song. Again, as it's understandably, it honors the former Soviet and Russian military, particularly mentioning the Afghanistan campaign, as we all know, 1979-89. So, dedicated to all fallen former Soviet or Russian soldiers. So it's kind of the tribute of respect to the former Soviet or Russian military. Does that make sense? So, any questions before we go to the next vi uh, quick video? Okay, uh, Sean, the second video, please. It's uh, with the day of the defender of the motherland from Russia, okay, on the first. Господа офицеры, по натянутым нервам я кордами вер эту песню пою тем, кто бросив карьеру живота не жалея свою грудь подставляет за Россию свою. Тем, кто выжил в Афгане, Свою честь не изгадив, Кто карьеры не делал От солдатских кровей. Я пою офицерам, Матерей пожалевшим, Возвратив им обратно Живых сыновей. Офицеры, офицеры, ваше сердце под прицелом За Россию и свободу до конца Офицеры, россияне, пусть свобода вас сияет Заставляя в унисон звучать сердца 
Господа офицеры, как сберечь вашу веру на разрытых могилах? This is the most elite unit traditionally, the so-called VDV or Airborne. Uh, units of Russia so far, and they played a big role in Afghanistan as well. So this is the two videos, just to set the stage, just to have a kind of sense of another culture. I, as an uh, army's uh, culture and language representative here, I always believe this is important to understand. Understand other cultures, other histories, uh, economic considerations, geopolitical, regional, and global considerations. It's all interconnected. Any questions in reference to any of those videos, did it make sense to you at all? Okay, did it give any sense what we are going to talk about a little bit? Obviously it does. Okay, and the reason we chose this topic today, it's the most up-to-day topic, purely the regional and global geopolitics, Russia's policies in the Middle East. With that, uh, before I pass the floor to our honorable guest speaker, I would like uh, from all, all of us to thank Ms. Borshevskaya, who ma made a trip all the way from Washington, D.C., to give us this very timely, very important presentation. Please, let's give her a warm welcome. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I apologize in advance. I am getting over a bad cold, so I may cough on occasion, but uh, I'm not contagious anymore. <laughs> it's been two and a half weeks. Um, and it's always very good to get out of Washington, uh, especially at a time like right now. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so um, I'm just going to make a few introductory remarks, as, as Mahir said, and I very much look forward to your questions because I think it's always much better to have a discussion rather than me talk, talk at you. Um, Russia's uh, intervention in Syria in September 2015 shocked and surprised many, uh, many including those who remember the Cold War, frankly. Um, but what happened was a long time in the making, and this is one point I really want to stress. What happened was not new, uh, and it was not sudden um, at all. There's nothing fundamentally new about Putin himself um, either. And the roots of what was to happen first in Georgia in 2008, then in Ukraine in 2014, and, and then in Syria, were there with Putin from the very beginning. Uh, for those of us who are watching him, who are paying attention, it's just that uh, what Putin was taking very slow and cautious steps at first, and it was easy to miss, but the roots were there from the very beginning. It was unmistakable. And the first sign of that was the very fact that the, one of the first things Putin did when he came to power is he went after free press. Uh, during the decade of the 1990s in Russia, this was a very difficult, a very traumatic, very chaotic period for Russian citizens. But one thing they did have, very briefly, was free press. And that's because Yeltsin tolerated it. Uh, Putin would do no such thing. Um, Putin chartered Russia's return to the Middle East from the very beginning since he came to power. Again, this is n none of this was new. None of this was sudden. Um, and if you look at his policies in the region, they can be traced uh, back to a man named Yevgeny Primakov, uh, a man who held a number of high positions in the, in the Russian government, including uh, head of security, head of intelligence services, and prime minister under Yeltsin. Um, Ye uh, Primakov, um, in the late 1990s, was already talking about several things. He was talking about a vision for a multipolar world. Um, he was concerned about NATO expansion and Western promotion of democracy, Western democratization efforts. So if you look at Putin's speeches, uh, he, his key points that he makes all the time, multipolar world, NATO expansion, Western democratization, these all have roots in Yevgeny Primakov. It's virtually verbatim uh, of, of what he had written about years before. Um, in, in Syria, Putin had a lot of goals, and uh, Syria really was the perfect culmination of everything Putin wanted to achieve. There were multiple goals, not just one or two. Um, one was to restore Russia's image as a great power. 
And this is something, um, you know, if you were to take a number one goal that Putin has in general when it comes to foreign or domestic policy. Um, and actually, you know, I'll get back to this point because there's a very little, there's often very little distinction between domestic and Russian policy in Russia. Um, but this emphasis on greatness uh, is something that Putin wanted to do from the very beginning. And there's very good reasons for that. If you think about it, for most of its history, uh, right, whether it was Russia or the Soviet Union, Russia was a great power. And it was only in the 90s, in the 1990s, with the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and the chaos that many people experienced, that the Russian people briefly lost that. So the restoration of, uh, of an image of a great power is something that resonates very well with the traumatized Russian population. Um, reduce Western, mainly U.S. influence. Very often when Putin says Western, he really means the United States. It's really, West is really a euphemism for the U.S. Um, and, uh, and that's something else that Putin wanted to do throughout the Middle East. And he, he made um, uh, outreach to many countries in the Middle East, whether traditional friends or adversaries before the Soviet Union. Putin wanted to restore Russia's influence everywhere uh, in the region. But it, with, Assad, with Syria in particular, re reduction of Western power was a really big deal uh, because it had to do with propping up Assad. And he wanted to prop up Assad because Putin genuinely believes that, uh, that the West orchestrates regime change. He's, con he's been convinced that the West orchestrated all co so-called color revolution, beginning with the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, uh, to the Arab Spring. Uh, he doesn't even allow for a possibility that people would rise on their own and organize a protest against an autocrat. Putin is convinced also that the U.S. State Department um, orchestrated anti-Putin protests. So when Putin officially returned to power to a third presidential term, in 2012, it happened against, amidst the largest uh, public protests that Russia has witnessed since the fall of the Soviet Union. I remember those protests very well. Uh, Putin came out and said that it was Hillary Clinton who gave the signal. He said she gave a signal for people to come out. Uh, and to this day, he continues to believe this. He, he doesn't think it was possible otherwise. Um, so in his view, if you let an autocrat fall, he will be next. It's, it's, it's almost defensive. Uh, even though it's contradictory from our thinking, it's aggressive to our thinking, and, and in fact that is objectively speaking, but from his perspective it's defensive. So if you let one other regime fall, you are that less secure for yourself. Um, he also wanted to distract Russia's domestic uh, audience. This is a point that doesn't get enough attention in the news because we often think that whatever is Putin does, it all has to do with what we did. It's always tied to our actions. That's not always the case. Uh, historically, um, there's a history that goes back even before the Soviet Union when Russian leaders uh, look for ways to distract the public with so-called short victorious wars. Um, to give you one example, before the Soviet Union, in 1904, um, uh, a Kremlin advisor, Vyacheslav Van Pleve, famously said, we need a short victorious war, and then came the, the 1905 war between Russia and Japan. Um, uh, the war of, of Afghanistan, uh, the, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, it happened at a time when the Kremlin was at its weakest. Uh, the first war in Chechnya under Yeltsin happened at a time when the Kremlin was at its weakest point. And one of the reasons why uh, Russia went into Chechnya, there, there were many reasons, but one of them was because Yeltsin's advisors thought it would achieve a quick and easy victory that would boost Yeltsin's ratings. Um, and by 2015, uh, he already, Putin already had gotten the Russian public to rally around the nationalist flag with Ukraine, with the annexation of Crimea. Um, but that kind of euphoria uh, that, that, he, that, that he raised, that, it, this emotion, it can only last for so long. High emotions don't last, they always come down, so you need something else. And Syria was a perfect uh, opportunity for this because the way Putin presented Syria to, to the domestic audience was almost like a movie, like a video game. It was pain-free, it was cost-free, um, no Russian citizens were dying, um, and it was cheap. And on top of this, Putin uh, said many times, it's a great opportunity for training and for displaying our weapons. So, uh, so it was really the perfect, uh, the perfect opportunity. The r one thing that the Russians don't want is another Afghanistan. The last thing I think the Russian people would want right now is to get bogged down in another war. And as you can see from the song, uh, the memories of Afghanistan, uh, the, the, and, and these are wounds that still haven't healed for many people. Um, and Putin was very careful about this. And I don't think he gets enough credit 
uh, for that. Many expected Russians to get bogged down in Syria. They expected body bags to start coming home. That's not exactly what happened. Uh, and I think it's because he was very careful to control um, what the Russian people really saw uh, about their campaign in Syria. Um, of course, what Putin wanted to divide NATO in Europe. And Syria was a perfect opportunity for this because Assad was already driving uh, refugees uh, into Europe, uh, which Europe was not ready for. All Putin had to do was help him. He didn't create the refugee crisis, but he helped make it worse. Um, and this helped the rise of far right and far left parties in Europe, which is, he's been sponsoring them for years. Um, so all these divisions, uh, conflictions, contradictions within NATO, within European allies, this is exactly what he wanted. Um, and to some extent he had deniability because he could say, well, look, it's not me, it's Assad. Um, he also wanted to use Syria as an opportunity to get the West to lift, san to lift sanctions um, um, that, that were uh, uh, in place against Russia after its aggression in, in Ukraine. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and uh, again, it was, the perfect, uh, it was a perfect opportunity. He helped create a crisis, but he pushed Western leaders to work with him if only they lifted the sanctions. Uh, and many European leaders repeatedly voiced uh, the possibility that they would be willing to do that, that they'd be willing to lift sanctions in exchange for cooperation with Russia in Syria. Um, and and the, sanctions, the sanctions hurt. Uh, you know, we can talk more uh, about the extent to which they hurt because that's a matter of debate, but they did hurt and, and Putin knew that. Um, Last, but certainly not least, uh, Putin wanted access to the Mediterranean through, warm water, through the warm water port in Tartus. Um, historically, uh, Kremlin leaders, again, before the Soviet Union, sought warm water ports. It began with Peter the Great. This is how far back uh, um, it goes. And, um, and Putin, um, Putin's a conservative leader. I, I use the word conservative in a sense that he looks backwards into Russian history. He tends to distort it. Uh, uh, but he looks backwards, and he always invokes historical figures that he also tends to misquote and m misconstrue, um, but his vision really is all about the past. Um, and in the past, uh, Russians always sought, warm, as a traditional land power, they always sought warm water ports. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's, not by, it's not just the port for the sake of having a port, it's creating a, creating an A2D2 denial area. Um, simply by being there, by militarily being present on the Mediterranean in Syria, um, Putin limits our ability to maneuver militarily. Um, you know, and, and we can talk more in depth about that, but I think part of his strategy, and I do think there is a vision, there is a strategy, people debate that as well, but I do think that there's more of a long-term vision that we give Putin credit for, and that is to create um, a, a to detail bubbles along the Mediterranean. It's basically a buffer zone. Uh, and historically, again, historically, Russian leaders always sought buffer zones. Catherine the Great had a famous quote. Um, she said, I have no better way to defend my borders than to expand them. Uh, again, I just want to just show you how far back this goes. This did not begin with Putin. It did not even begin with the Soviet Union, necessarily. Um, Russia always, ex Imperial Russia always expanded. Um, as, as it incorporated new territories, it created a perpetual cycle of insecurities um, where the more land uh, Russia had, the harder it was to govern. These were remote territories with a lot of different people, different nationalities. They questioned their loyalties. So they sought new buffer zones. And, and, and again, you acquired more lands, again, more insecurity. So um, Russia's historical expansion, I'm getting a bit on, off topic, but I think it's important to know Russia's history. Um, was always more about insecurity, and, it's some, and many historians say that Russian expansion was always a sign of weakness than a sign of strength, which is different from the way the West uh, expanded. Um, so, uh, so to get back to Syria, the, Syria was just an ideal case for everything that Putin wanted to, um, to accomplish. Um, but Syria is not the only place. Uh, Russia's relations with Iran um, are the warmest they've been in the last 500 years. Uh, and uh, analysts, when they talk about Russia-Iran relations, they tend to focus uh, solely on the history. Um, they, they talk about the historic rivalry between these two countries. And it's absolutely accurate. These are historic rivals. It's a very complicated relationship. Uh, Russia and Iran fought two wars in the 19th century. Uh, Iran lost both and ceded uh, much of the territory, what, what, parts of what's now Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, and part of Turkmenistan to Russia. 
Um, so historically, there's lots of distrust, very deep distrust towards Russia uh, in Iran. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, at this time, at this uh, current point in time, they share a very important uh, goal of resistance to the West. They both want to present, prevent Western uh, influence in the Middle East. And that's what unites them above all of their differences. So I'm skeptical that in the short term, at least, it's going to be possible to drive a wedge between Russia and Iran. I know that there's been, uh, there's been a lot of talk about this in Washington, and this is something we've been debating. Uh, I tend to think that for all their differences, at this point, they need each other too much. And this may not last. Um, this very well may change uh, down the road, but right now I just don't see how, the, how it's going to happen. Um, it, the fact of the matter is Putin favors the Shia axis in the Middle East. Uh, he wants to be, have good relations with everybody, with Shia, with Sunni, and with Israel, I, I should mention. Um, but he favors the Shia bloc. And, and I don't think it's by accident at all. Uh, the Sunni powers are historically pro-Western, uh, the Shia are not. Uh, and together with another anti-Western power in the region, he's in a better position to resist the West than on his own. Um, on Egypt and Turkey, I just want to say a few words on, on Egypt. There's, a, there's been a steady growth, uh, steady growth of uh, Russia-Egypt relations in the last several years. Uh, in 2015, uh, for the first time, they began conducting, conducting naval drills, and they're talking about doing more military exercises together. Uh, there have been a number of weapons sales. Uh, and again, they're talking about more, more and more, more and more of these deals. Um, certainly, uh, Putin and CC see eye to eye on a number of issues, including their approach uh, towards terrorism. Uh, certainly, Putin is not going to lecture CC on human rights issues, and that's something that uh, that's something that's very attractive to him. Um, uh, with Turkey, Turkey deserves a, a special attention. Uh, uh, Erdogan and Putin had a very close relationship from the very beginning, uh, so much so, in fact, that, um, uh, that, that people would often talk about how they held me if they had meetings together, they uh, asked everybody to leave the room because they were just really comfortable together. They had a lot of things to discuss, and they didn't want anybody else in the room. Um, they share many qualities. They both went after free press. They both uh, presided over a number of economic improvements in their own respective countries. Um, and they're both now at the end of the, the trajectory where the, econo the economy is going downhill. Um, but, uh, but Erdogan uh, never agreed with Putin on Assad. The, the, the one point of disagreement has always been Assad and Syria. Uh, they have been able to comp compartmentalize these differences and continue a very strong economic relationship. Um, uh, Turkey and Egypt, uh, I should say both of these, are uh, top two tourist destinations for Russian tourists. Um, and Russia is Turkey's number one, has been Russia's number one trading partner for many years. Um, but um, as you probably know, there was a hiccup in the relationship when uh, a Russian jet entered Turkish airspace. Uh, uh, Ankara shut down the plane and the pilot, the pilot died. Uh, it became a major international scandal. Putin said uh, that they stabbed us in the back. He enacted sanctions. He wanted Erdogan to apologize. For months, Erdogan refused to do so. Uh, but finally he succumbed, and he did. Uh, and when he made that apology, um, although p some people say he, the apology wasn't as far as Putin wanted him to go, he expressed regret that things happened. He didn't quite apologize the way Putin wanted him to. But nonetheless, he, he, he did do, uh, by and large, he, he, he did come back, and he did admit that he was wrong. And by doing that, he also admitted that he needs Putin more than Putin needs him. So what we see happening right now is Turkey falling deeper and deeper into Russia's, uh, Putin's sphere of influence. I would argue much more so than even Erdogan himself may realize, because this is not an equal relationship. And remember, Turkey is a NATO ally. Uh, you have a NATO ally who did a complete 180 on Assad. Uh, no longer does Erdogan say that Assad must go, and it's, it's a position that uh, Erdogan maintained for years. Uh, instead, uh, uh, Turkey, Iran, and Russia go to Astana to discuss the future of Syria, where the U.S. is an observer. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I think what worries me the most is that I think Erdogan continues to think that it's an equal relationship, and it's not. 
um, and it has to do with the fact that uh, Russia has very long and very deep connections to the Kurds that go back about 200 years. Uh, and Erdogan, as you know, one of his biggest struggles of his presidency has been with uh, Kurdish nationalism. Um, and Putin is very pragmatic about this. He can turn on and off these relationships. He always plays the Kurdish card against Turkey, which is what the Soviet Union did as well. Uh, Putin, uh, Erdogan doesn't have the same uh, leverage over Russia. Uh, and even on the economic side, they both need each other, but, uh, but Erdogan needs him more because Putin can always turn off the flow of Russian tourists and Russian tourists can go elsewhere, uh, but Turkey is suffering. So, so that's Turkey. And um, in terms of what's next, um, I think Putin is not leaving Syria. I think he will keep working to cast himself basically as a peacemaker, uh, where in reality the peace is the last thing on his mind. He has neither the resources nor the willingness to stabilize Syria. As you know, uh, most of Russian airstrikes have not been against ISIS. Uh, he said he was there to fight the terrorism and mainly ISIS, but he fought everybody but ISIS really to present the West with a choice. It's either ISIS now or Assad, therefore you have to choose Assad. Um, uh, but I think he wants some kind of a, a solution on his terms. And so far, um, it looks like he's getting it. I, I, I wish I could be more optimistic, but we've been absent from this conflict for years. Um, and he was very skillful at stepping into a vacuum and he's taken a leadership position. Um, but I think the other place where he's increasingly turning is Libya. Because if you follow the Russian policymakers' statements for the last several months, increasingly they're looking at Libya and they're thinking, they're talking about, uh, again, terrorists taking hold of Libya. Um, uh, Putin supports a general in Libya, a general named Khalifa Haftar, who is an anti-Islamist who's taken control of Libya's east, but uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with radical um, uh, Islamism, uh, is a very divisive figure and not, simply not the right person to bring stability to the country. Uh, and uh, Khalifa is, um, Haftar uh, does not support the UN-backed central government, which is civilian. Um, he wants instead military control. He's gone back to Moscow several times asking them for help and they made uh, a number of statements that suggest that they in fact would be quite willing to do that. Uh, very recently, um, uh, Haftar toured uh, Russian aircraft carrier Admiral Kuznetsov as it was leaving Syrian waters uh, uh, via Libya. And um, reportedly he held a video conference call with Sergei Shoigu and that, that's also a really big deal. Uh, not everybody, not every general uh, in the Middle East tends to do that. Um, so I think Libya looks like another possibility for another short term, sort of short term victorious war, another place where um, unless the West steps in, uh, Putin can come in and say, well, I, you know, you guys failed in Syria. I brought order out of chaos, and here's another place of chaos that can, but here I am. I'm helping bring stability. I'm helping bring peace. You guys backed the wrong person. I'm backing the right person. And long term, if, if that happens, if, if that scenario plays out, uh, mm -hmm. no peace will come to Libya. There will be more fighting that will break out. But in the short term, people, uh, Putin again can have the short victory that, that um, uh, that he wants, and uh, very importantly, access to the Benghazi port. Uh, the Libya campaign uh, cost Russia, the NATO Libya campaign uh, in 2012, cost Russia over $4 billion, but they also had access to the Benghazi port, and I think they want access to the port as well, because again, if you look at the map, um, it's all along the same arc um, on the Mediterranean. It's another A2D detail, uh, A2D2 um, area. Um, uh, I think Algeria and Yemen, Yemen are the two places to look, and here there's less information and more uncertainty, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I think they're important to watch. Um, um, and, th and another reason why I'm not very optimistic is because Putin is also gearing towards uh, presidential elections in 2018. He's going to win the election. I, I don't think anyone, ha anyone has any doubts that anyone besides Putin is going to be president, that, that it's not a real election. Um, but he's going to be uh, uh, looking again for ways to distract the public. Uh, Russia itself is in the process of slow, uh, very slow degradation. Um, but it's not going to collapse anytime soon. So on the one hand, uh, the Russian people feel economic problems. They are, they are, they are serious. But on the other hand, um, it, it's not as, as, as drastic as it was before the fall of the Soviet Union. And I lived through the fall of the Soviet Union in Moscow. I remember it very well as a child. This is not what's happening right now. If anything, um, IMF actually predicts growth uh, in 2017. 
So it's a system that's, uh, that's lagging, but, but it's not collapsing anytime soon at all. And Putin will always need to look for distractions. Um, he's also increasingly um, paranoid, and, and it, which is something that a lot of commentators note. And one example of this is uh, the fact that his, his National Guard uh, that he created uh, about a year ago, his own personal guard, uh, this is no longer, uh, in other words, this is not a, um, a, a unit that serves the state that's about protecting the security of the state, it's protecting one person. Um, so this increased paranoia that you see playing out uh, coupled with his, again, belief that, uh, that we've encircled him, that this, the, these very old, old ideas of Russia as a besieged empire, um, I, I think are going to keep playing out, and I think Russia is going to keep militarizing. Uh, I, I see it in, in the cultural uh, aspects. I see it in the revival of Stalinism uh, in, in Russia. Um, even Russian uh, uh, writers, authors who are on cultural issues note this as well, that uh, Putin is pushing these psychological, these emotional buttons in a very traumatized population, and he's doing a very good job um, of it. So I, I think from his perspective, we're going to be the enemy no matter who is in the White House. Uh, it's really quite irrelevant. Um, if you look at uh, all previous attempts of American presidents, Democrat or Republican, uh, to improve relations with Russia. They all started out the same way, where a president would come in, blame the predecessor for why, the rela why relations broke down, um, and then try to have some kind of a, a reset or, or you know, give it some other name. Um, and it never worked out. Uh, I suspect something similar is going to play out here because he needs us to be the enemy to justify what he's doing. Um, so I think the, most, the best thing we could do, and this is my policy advice, is to regain a leadership position in the Middle East. Uh, Putin knows his limitations, I think. He's quite aware of his limitations. He's not, uh, uh, he, he's not uh, um, as crazy, and um, uh, he's just a lot more calculating, I think, that people give him credit for. Um, uh, he steps into places, uh, he, he is into vacuums where America retreats. Um, a strong, so a strong leadership position um, and um, uh, regaining, again, the trust of our allies in the region who, who felt abandoned by us. Um, we also need to counter Russian information warfare, which is something we have not woken up to, I think. To the, we're slowly starting to talk about it, but we haven't realized exactly what's happening. And I just want to say very quickly, you know, we, we, there's a lot of these terms that are flying around, like new generation, uh, hybrid warfare, and so forth. Um, uh, I think I think it's it's true, but I also want to highlight that again. That's nothing new. They're doing the same thing they've been doing before. It's it's the same playbook. It's maybe it's different tools that are maybe that are more modern and adopted to the current environment. But but at its core, as a strategy, this is nothing new at all. Um, and we should also support uh, continue supporting democracy efforts uh, because we need to stay true to our values. And there are people, many people across the globe in Russia and in the Middle East and elsewhere who really do need us to be uh, the beacon of hope that we were supposed to be. Uh, we've forgotten that, I think, uh, in the last several years. But they do want us to stand by our values. So it's strategic and moral clarity also. Um, I think that's, uh, and finally, a realization that we're in this for the long haul. This is not going to be just a few years. Uh, this is, uh, we, we, we don't have a long-term strategy on Russia. We've been missing it for quite some time. And we need to have one. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Borshevsky, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. So uh, at this time, this is, the floor is yours. Uh, just you know that we also have the multiple outstations. Uh, please chime in at any time. So this is the time for questions, answers, and comments. Please, uh, if you have a question or you want to make a comment, please use the microphones on the table. Just make sure the, uh, the green light is on. And uh, in the back seats, there are microphones across the room. OK? So the floor is yours. The first question, please. It's on. Yes, it's on. OK. Mm -hmm. So going back to your final statement about the countering of the Russian um, information operations and their propaganda narrative, with the closed media there and their inability for free press, yeah. do you have a recommendation on how we start getting after that? Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Um, I think we can begin with such things as um, 
uh, broadcasts to Russian-speaking uh, uh, populations, uh, at least in the, in the former Soviet Union or the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, shows such as Current Time, it's a show, it's a, it's a Voice of America show. They're, in fact, it's, it's now becoming a channel that's going to be broadcasting 24 hours a day. Um, uh, things such as internet also. Uh, at this point, the Russian internet is not completely closed. Uh, a Russian citizen that really wants to get access to information, uh, uh, he will, she would have to dig for it, but they can, still, they can still find it. I mean, what Putin has done is he made it so that um, most people just don't bother trying to look for information anymore. It's just confusion. People are so confused, they give up. Um, but I think the internet is another place. Um, we don't have the same options that we did during the Cold War when RFERL and Voice of America broadcast. And I remember those broadcasts. Uh, unfortunately, we lost a lot of that, that space. And um, I don't have a very good solution on how to regain it, but we should keep looking for that because the, the, one of our key challenges is that the Russian public is completely brainwashed and we don't have very good tools on how to present them, how to present them with alternative information. Yes, Gary, please. About a year ago, uh, I think it was, I read an article, an analysis of Russian politics that talked about Putin and his relationship to other power brokers within, within the Kremlin, and that he was, at least at that time, concerned that he was going to be toppled by challengers within his own uh, regime. Is, do you think that's still true, or has he successfully eliminated a number of these challengers? Um, it's very hard to talk about what's happening inside the Kremlin because we, because <laughs> we don't, we, 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 in the end, we just don't know. But, but, well, what I have seen is that he re, he replaced uh, most of his closest circle with people who are much younger um, and who tend to be psychophantic to him. Um, whether or not that's a sign that there really was something brewing inside or it was just his own paranoia, that's, it's hard for me to tell, I just don't know. But, but, but I have seen that he, he's replacing his, uh, his circle. And again, all of these moves, the National Guard, all of these changes, um, at the very least, they, they point to his concern for losing power. If I may real quick, uh, Sergei Ivanov is an example. Mm -hmm. the, there was a former chief of staff uh, his name was Sergei Ivanov, and he was considered in Russia the second most powerful uh, and, uh, person. And he was removed from his post very unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. So it could be kind of a, a move proving the fact that he's trying to secure uh, his position as the single leader. Any other questions? So you talked uh, that there's no imminent collapse of, a, of the economic system right. for Russia. But it, that implies that it's, in, uh, that it's vulnerable. And so while the normative impetus would be, you know, hey, there's vulnerability, how can we accelerate that vulnerability? Dan uh, the vulnerability also leads to Putin maybe being less calculated, more desperate in some cases. So is there a potential that instead of finding ways to accelerate that collapse, you know, we actually would be put into a policy position where we'd have to prevent that collapse because of the broader calamity that would do in terms of the global economics as well as the regional stability, whether we do that covertly or otherwise. That's a very good question. Yeah, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, first, I agree with you. Uh, a collapse in Russia would not be very good for us either uh, for exactly the reasons that, that you outlined. Uh, I, think, I think it may very well be a possibility. Um, I, at this point, though, I think there are too many, f it's, it's very hard to predict. You know, whenever people ask me this question, uh, there, there's just too many factors that play into this. It's hard for me to give um, a very definitive answer. What I, what I do see right now is a couple of things. Um, Russia's most talented people are leaving. And Russia's biggest, one of Russia's biggest problems is, 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 a, is a brain drain of its most talented, educated people. Um, uh, a drastic population decline uh, in terms of births, um, especially among ethnic Russians. Uh, and of course, an economy that is, uh, that is inherently corrupt. There's no rule of law in Russia. Nobody buys Russian products. It's, it's, uh, uh, no, nobody wants to do business in Russia. Um, and uh, it, it's really an economy that's mainly focused on, uh, on raw materials and weaponry. Um, but at the same time, Russia retains these, a lot of these strengths. And so a lot of people have, predict, have been predicting a collapse. And it's just it's not happening at all. Uh, I don't see it. 
Um, so I think, I think more down the road, I think you're right. I think what I think we need to do is we need to be much more careful at looking at what's happening in the Russian economy and why it's not collapsing. Um, but I, I think we were a little too, we expected that there would be a collapse. This is all short term and that's just not happening. Uh, and maybe that would give us a better understanding of what we need to do as well and find a better answer. There's a great report that I recommend to a lot of people. It was put out, by, I think, by the NATO, NATO Defense College. It's called uh, Towards Securitization. It came out in uh, the summer of last year, I think in July. And it reports at length at, at um, what Putin is doing militarily and how he's shifting uh, the priorities on militarization instead of economic development. And it's very hard for us in the West to understand why somebody would do that. And we think, well, if you, you know, isn't that suicide in the long term? Uh, we think that a definition of a strategy is somebody who uh, invests in economic development. I remember getting even, you know, some of my own relatives had asked me uh, when Putin annexed Crimea, why did he do that? It's an, it's an economic burden. That makes no sense at all from our perspective. Um, but but Russian, uh, Russia was never about economic development. This is just not what the Kremlin did, uh, neither in the Soviet times nor before it. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand, uh, to understand the mindset, because there is long-term thinking. It's just very different from ours. And it's that securitization, that focus on security. Also, Part of it is shielding Russia from sanctions uh, towards self-reliancy, self-sufficiency. Uh, that will help sustain the economy, I think, for longer than we expect it to. That's the best answer I can give. I wish I could give a more precise answer, but we don't know. <laughs> yep. Other questions, please? Yeah, in, in your discussion, you uh, indicated what I call Russia and Putin are poking at the U.S. and the West. Uh, is he consciously not poking at China? Yes. at the same time, and why do you think that is? I think, uh, so the real threat to Russia it has never been NATO. The real threat to Russia is China. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, a good example of that, there's many good examples of that, frankly, that go back uh, a really long time, even during the Cold War, as you know, that they, these were not friends. Um, and Russia, unlike China, is a rising, uh, so China, unlike Russia, is a rising power. Economically, it's a rising power. Uh, on, on Russia's far east, uh, Russian population is slowly becoming replaced, uh, Russian ethnic population is slowly becoming replaced by the Chinese. Um, I think he's not talking about it because uh, he knows that they're the real threat and, he's, he, and, and he knows that if he were, he can't take on China. Uh, I think he's purposely diverting attention from that. Um, he may have other plans that, uh, that we simply don't know about, but, uh, but that's the real threat to Russia. Dave, you have a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, Dave, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Because it's being recorded, if you don't mind, uh, come up to the microphone. You say that we should assert or reassert our leadership. Do we do this by armed force or do we do it by diplomacy? Hmm. I think uh, when it comes to the Middle East broadly, we need to do it uh, by diplomacy and by presence, uh, including military presence. Uh, when it comes to Syria, um, we've been absent from the Syrian conflict for so long. Uh, in Syria, I think uh, we do need to uh, begin thinking about how to use uh, limited military force. And one thing that I'm a very strong advocate of is uh, no-fly zones to protect civilians. This is something that should have happened in 2013 uh, when President Obama uh, declared his red lines in Syria uh, and then failed to enforce them. And this was a very clear signal to Putin, but also to all other dictators across the world that America will not stand by what it says it will do. Um, and, uh, and I think that's one thing that encouraged Putin to step into Syria because he saw we weren't doing anything. So I think in Syria in particular, we need to do safe zones. And we need to enforce them militarily. If we do any kinds of ceasefire agreements, um, you know, in the past when we had ceasefire agreements, there was never any military component behind it. it, it Obama made it very clear that, um, that, if, that, that there wouldn't be any clear re military repercussions if Assad violated a ceasefire. And I'm not saying, there shouldn't, well, I'm not saying we should do anything against Russia, but we should have targeted Assad's force, Assad's military force. 
uh, Assad's air force if he violated a ceasefire. And so if in the future, if there are such ceasefires, there should be a credible threat of use of military force if Assad violates, violates them. Uh, that would be a start, I think. Uh, I'm sorry, you had the next question, right? No, you. Yes. Mm -hmm. You brought up the I, uh, you brought up the idea the historic idea of the need for a short decisive sorry short mm -hmm. victorious war. Um, however, we when we have sought short decisive victories in the Middle East and tried to do it with minimizing casualties, we've been unable to. Mm -hmm. If the Soviet Union intends to actually bring uh, the opponents of Assad to culmination, are they actually going to be able to do that with uh, without incurring casualties? If they do incur casualties, does that then counter the need, uh, counter the benefit of the short, decisive victory? And then, working on that same line of thought, you mentioned expansion of Russian attempting of Russia attempting to gain influence in uh, Libya as well. What is going to be the barrier that prevents them going from looking for a short victory and winding up with a quagmire? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so, on your first question. Um, so far in Syria, um, I have to say, Putin has not been in a quagmire at all. Uh, the Russian people themselves were very worried that that's exactly what would happen. If you have, in fact, if you looked at some of the early analysis uh, from, from the Russian uh, community, the, the first thing they said was, this is going to be another Afghanistan for us. Um, but that's not what happened so far. Uh, they, I don't trust the, the I don't trust the uh, the, the the official um, uh, numbers of the cost of the Syria campaign. I'm sure that those numbers are not real. But, uh, but at the same time, it does look like it's something that for now they they've been very easily able to afford. And Putin also used Syria as a training exercise, and he was pretty explicit about it. Um, he, he said, you know, the best way to train is in combat, and this is what our guys are getting. And so far they've had combat in Georgia, uh, Ukraine, and in Syria. Um, and I think one reason why they've been able to do this is because they really have not gone after ISIS. Uh, they, they have not gone after the people they said they were going to go after. Um, and they maintained a fairly limited targeted <coughs> presence. Um, uh, now, I'm sure that, again, the real costs are higher in terms of both blood and treasure, but, but it doesn't look to, but, but, the, uh, but so far, they're not suffering at all. I just don't see any sign of suffering on the military side in terms of, you know, producing less or, you know, anything else you would look at as a sign of, of incurring high costs. I just don't see that. And I think one reason why he's looking for a quick solution in Syria now, he's trying to seize the moment while he can, it's because he can sort of have his cake and eat it too. He can have a, some kind of an agreement. Right, that means they, they're still going to be present in Syria, but they don't have to expand a lot of resources. They get their entry into the Middle East, they get their port, they get their Khmimim air airbase, um, but they don't need to expend a lot of resources. And they have somebody in Damascus, Assad or not, who ensures their interests. Um, um, in Libya, I think what would prevent Putin is, again, a strong American presence uh, that would deter him. Uh, and, and I mean that now in a diplomatic sense. If we, uh, if we show that we, we, we take a very clear position, uh, if, we show, if we say that we're present and we're active, we're involved with the European Union, I, I think that would give him pause before he gets involved. I mean, part of what's happening now is European leaders are actually looking towards Russia uh, to take a more constructive uh, but decisive position in Libya. The European leaders are actually looking to Russia right now. Um, and part of it is the absence of American leadership. Uh, so in Libya, you, you know, many, there's still many questions. I'm certainly not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying right now it looks like a good candidate because we're absent from the situation. Um, but you're also right that it's hard to imagine how much longer they can sustain uh, an, a, a presence everywhere, uh, and I, I, I don't think they can eventually, and I, but I also think that Putin is cognizant of that, and I think he is trying very hard to have an appearance of a presence that in reality doesn't cost much. But long term, long term it, is, you know, it is a decline, like I said. It's just that it's hard to predict when it's going to happen, and I don't see it now. Mark, you had this in the next question. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll kind of piggyback on that question, which he kind of stole from me anyway. But. The, I was reading a piece by David Patrick Harkas on RFERL yesterday, and his, his, his assessment 
is that basically Putin is pursuing kind of the same thing he's doing in Ukraine, which is a, a de facto partition, um, a long frozen conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, a difference here would seem to be, again, this is not going to be, it looks like a short victorious war, but probably a long-term presence for the Russian armed forces to maintain such a situation. The Russians have been very open <laughs> lately talking about how it has been Russian commanders that have been there with the Syrian forces, in some cases actually commanding in every operation. Um, and with the loss of four Russians last week in, in a roadside attack, something that unfortunately U.S. forces began to learn a lot about over the years, I'm wondering if, if if the cost is going to start in the next few months to be a bit more than the Russians can bear. And, and perhaps if we see these kinds of attacks, say week to week, weather attitudes may change a little bit. So I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on, on whether there is a, a long-term satisfaction with a frozen conflict and whether that cost is really going to start to be too much for the Russians at some point. Sure. I think there is a satisfaction with the fro long-term frozen conflict. Uh, and I agree uh, with the piece that you cited. It's very much similar to what he's doing in Ukraine. Um, I'm, uh, I, I don't think uh, that uh, I, I don't see a, a sudden influx of bombings against the Russians that are all of a sudden is going to bring up the, the casualty toll from uh, 27, I think it's now, uh, to, 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 to you know, hundreds and thousands. I think if that were to happen, if body bags like that started coming home, and those would be very hard to hide even for them, uh, then, then, then you'd have, Putin would have a lot of problems. Um, I just think at, at this point, I'm skeptical that, it, that the death toll is going to be so, that it's going to rise drastically this high right now. In the future, it's possible, but not, not yet. Any other questions, comments? Yes, sir, please. Second, sorry for the second question. Um, what do you think are the, if not common, at least compatible areas, issues that we haven't focused on with Putin that we should better the relationship mm -hmm. and to contain him? I think part of the problem for us has been, there are two parts. Uh, we, we don't have enough Russia analysts. Uh, we, uh, Russia studies for many years have, uh, have had very few, few, fewer and fewer people really. Uh, and I think we're just now starting to catch up. Um, uh, I would like to see more people trained uh, and really trying to understand Russia uh, before they, they, they jump to conclusions. Um, the other part issue, I think, is that, uh, well, for one thing, I'm concerned in terms of areas, but I think we are looking at it as I'm concerned about the Baltics. I'm, I'm concerned about the Baltic states. Um, uh, but I think um, a little bit more, um, more holistically, you know, we tend to think that we can cooperate with Russia on one issue but not the other. We, we think we can compartmentalize everything and I, th and, and I think the Kremlin usually looks at relationship as, as all part of one whole. And so if we don't have good relations uh, overall, if Putin is convinced that we're his enemy, that we're trying to bring him down on multiple fronts, uh, I, I'm skeptical that, that, uh, the, that, that these compart this compartmentalization would work. Um, I think um, I think just uh, uh, re you know realizing that Putin knows us very well, and uh, he understands that uh, very often American politicians, in particular, don't look beyond elections, and so they are prone to short-term solutions that will also boost their own victory. He doesn't need to worry about that. Um, so it's not a direct answer to your question because I think we are looking more or less at the right regions, but we don't have enough people, we don't have enough resources, and we still don't we still don't have a, a, a a comprehensive strategic vision on Russia. Is it answers your question? Yes, ma'am, please. Hi, thank you. I'm curious um, if you can provide comments on the situation between Putin and Lukashenko and anything on if, they, if he has any long-term interests or strategies for that country in Belarus. Um, okay, uh, I haven't been following that issue very closely. Um, uh, Belarus remains the last European dictatorship, and I think it's going to stay stay that way. Um, 
again, I haven't been following that, that, that relationship too closely. I, I think that Belarus will be important for Putin, uh, and I think he's going to uh, keep a close eye on it, and uh, he's going to want to ensure that whoever is in charge is somebody that conforms to his interests. But beyond that, I just can't comment. Sorry. <laughs> yes, sir, please. Uh, you mentioned that Astana started to play uh, like a role in this Middle East policies of Russia. And my question is, how is uh, like a Central Asian country's positions are important for Russian in different like theaters? Mm -hmm. And that's it. I think, oh, no, I think they're quite important. I, uh, Astana is a statement. Uh, the fact that the talks were held in Astana is a, uh, I think it's a very important statement. Kazakhstan um, is not exactly a neutral country. It's, it's a, an active member of, of the customs union. And uh, although Kazakhstan tries to diversify away from Russia, it's very firmly planted in the Russian camp. Uh, and Putin um, has been trying to play on um, Russian ethnic minorities in Kazakhstan uh, in recent years. Um, precisely when Kazakhstan tried to move away from Russia. There's, he's been trying to kind of stir concerns in Kazakhstan that they may have another referendum of their own in the north. Um, uh, I think Central Asia plays a very important uh, part in, in his strategic thinking, as do the Caucasus, uh, frankly. Yes, sir, please. Mm -hmm. So what do you think uh, Putin's reaction would be? So you said you would recommend that the U.S assuming with NATO as well, would set up safe zones or the no-fly area in Syria and all? What do you think Putin's reaction to that would be? I don't think he'll be very happy. Um, but, um, but I think it's something, but, you know, we, we didn't want to do it for so long in, because we were afraid of an accidental clash with, with the Russians. Um, but the problem is that uh, weakness doesn't deter aggression either. It, it tends to encourage it, and Putin has perceived us as weak for a very long time. Um, you know, and I think critics of a safe zone would be right to say that, it, it, that there would be a chance of a clash, but the fact of the matter is, um, as things have been going up until now, there were risks of clashes every day. Um, it's just not something that's been reported in the news, but we, we always risk a clash. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not accident, accidental that, uh, that a Russian plane entered Turkish airspace. Russian planes have been entering Israeli uh, airspace as well. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's, it's, it's an easy solution, um, but I think we have to do it because there's an ethnic cleansing in Syria. There has, it, it, this is not a civil war. It has not been a civil war for a very long time. Uh, and we have a responsibility, and there's precedent for that as well uh, in op Operation Provide Comfort in, in Iraq. Um, so uh, my, my greatest point is that um, uh, historically, when uh, in, in the Russian mindset, if they feel a weakness, they're going to keep pushing, and that's what they've been doing. And, 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 uh, uh, and the risk exists either way. Well, what would you do if there, if there was the accidental... There, I don't buy the yeah. term accidental contact, and if you set up a, a, you know, a safe zone with military force protecting that, the odds of there being a conflict increase. What would his reaction be to that? Or what do you, what, I mean, it's, it's your thoughts. It's yeah. completely, like, yeah. you don't have a crystal ball. But what do you think he would do to that? Would he escalate, or would he try and de-escalate as rapidly as possible? And, you know, if, if we're showing yeah. force and we're right. showing strength like right. that, how does that play out, in other words? I don't think Putin wants to have a direct conventional confrontation uh, with the United States. Uh, I, I just, I don't think he wants a World War III. Uh, I think depending on how this plays out, I mean, I'm sure there would be some communication uh, when, when the safe, if the safe zone were to set up. Uh, I, I think uh, he may very well want to try to de-escalate. I think we might very well want to try to de-escalate. I don't think anybody here wants a, a, war, a clash with the Russians either. So for that reason, I, um, I think one, one way this could realistically play out is that you, we could have some de-escalatory de measures. Um, it, it's hard to predict. Um, like I said, look, I'm not saying that there's no risk, but, but there will always be a risk. And it's going to keep increasing. So can we assume, based on that, that if we chose to do safe zones, we being a larger we, yeah. uh, that it would be a, a unilateral in terms of the team, the coalition, if you will, 
vice going through the end and getting a chapter six, chapter seven type of mandate, purely because Russia, I would assume, would veto that regardless <coughs> and force yeah. us to not make it a, an international legitimacy, right. but more of a, a conscious decision <coughs> otherwise. I think so. Yeah. I think so, yeah. And again, there's precedent for that. Right. Right. Not that we wouldn't do it, but we wouldn't be able to do it under that mandate. Right. Yes, sir, please. Uh, you're following the analogy of like the, the, the enemy of my enemies and my friend, and there's a marriage of convenience between Russia and Iran. Question one is what led the U.S. government to enter the Iran nuclear deal if, if, if there is a kind of marriage of convenience now between Russia and Iran? And where do you see this play out now that there's, you know, we're looking possibly to withdraw the agreement and then that, that basically the relationship and how that plays out into the kind of love triangle between U.S., Russia, and Iran. Mm, okay. Um, I'm, so, I'm not sure if I understood the first half of your question. You were asking how did, uh, what, what was the U.S., uh, why, why did the U.S. Um, well, you said there, there is, a histori is a historical precedent that there is animosity between yes. Russia and Iran because of yes. previous wars from previous right. centuries. But then now there's kind of a marriage of convenience right. because they both are trying to go against Western right. U.S. aggression. Right. So how do you see that play out? And why did, we, if we, having knowing that, mm -hmm. why did we enter into, what are your feelings as far as entering into the Iran nuclear deal and, and, and how does that play out? Oh, I see. Uh, well, Russia didn't, you know, Russia didn't need to be convinced of the dangers of a nuclear Iran. Um, if anything, uh, it's the one country out of the P5 plus one group that I think would be most impacted, most directly, just geographically, if Iran were to have a nuclear weapon. Um, but um, so, so they never they never did us any favors. Uh, I, I think um, I think there persists a myth um, in Washington that uh, th that that Putin uh, cooperated with us on the Iran deal. He did what was in his best interest. And uh, at the same time, he consistently diluted sanctions against Iran uh, for years. And he also was able to extract concessions from the West in uh, return for cooperation in the P5 plus one group, in, in, in return for supporting the sanctions. Um, uh, and the, the Iran deal, as it came out, was great for him because the, one of the first things he did is he lifted the ban on the freeze on the S-300 sales. Uh, to Iran. They're not talking about a $10 billion weapons deal. They, they, the Iranians basically presented a shopping list uh, to the Kremlin. So, um, and, and Putin uh, took a, um, Putin basically tried to milk it for all it's worth in terms of his own leadership position. Uh, you know, the foreign ministry, Russian foreign ministry tweeted that the Iran deal was largely based on Russian thinking or Russian uh, diplomatic efforts. and. Uh, so he took a lot of credit for that. Um, so in the way the Iran deal was set up, they, they, they were very happy about it. So I, I, there's no contradiction at all. Yes, ma'am, please. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I have kind of another piggyback question on Colonel Connelly about the safe zone. So you started out talking about that, um, back to my notes, sorry, that part of it, it was, it was two front with Syria, mm -hmm. um, basically protecting another leader, so to protect himself because of his paranoia that set in, and also the requirement or desire for a warm water mm -hmm. port. Then you, and um, so I'm trying to probably train a thought here, and then you talked about um, the uh, safe zones and how we are perceived as weak. Mm -hmm. And so now we have this new administration. So I kind of want to leave that piece of it out right now because we're not really sure kind of where that's going to go. So if we were to set up the safe zone, we're perceived as weak. Um, making a very bold, uneducated statement here, I would, be, I would be concerned that Russia would try to push the limit just because we've s repeatedly drawn a red line in the sand and then done nothing mm -hmm. about it um, in order to protect what he defines as his position in Russia. Does that make sense? So he's mm -hmm. protecting Assad because it, you know, then yeah. he protects himself, right? Mm -hmm. So if we set up a safe zone and it is in fact enforced or at least somewhat honored, does that then decrease his strength and his presence of how the people in Russia see him and slowly start to lead to his demise if they do not identify him as this strong, powerful leader that can protect these regions? Yeah, it would, be, uh, it, it would make him look weak, uh, in a sense. It would, uh, it would diminish his influence in the country. Uh, in, in, in the conflict, and, uh, and so you know, he wouldn't be happy about it, uh, um, I, I think, um, and you're right, I think he would try to keep testing us to see where else, what else he could do. 
Um, but Putin is also very good at playing a weak hand. He always has been. So um, I think, but I think, look, I think in the end, if we were to put all of our political will behind it, I don't think there's much he could do about it, uh, about the safe zones themselves. Uh, he, he, would he may very well look for other opportunities you know, to test us and so forth. But, uh, but again, I, be because I don't think he wants a direct military uh, confrontation with the United States, I, I, I think in the end there would be little he could do. But you're right, because for so, this, this went on for so long, you know, um, he may not think that we're serious, that things have changed. So yeah, yeah I think you make a good point. John, please. <laughs> I actually have two questions, uh, but they're different. So I'll pose one, let you answer that, and then okay. I'll jump to the other one. You, know, you had talked about the establishment of no-fly zones as, as one thing to do, and that we don't have a dedicated strategy there. By the same token, having a strategy isn't necessarily a recipe for success either. It can be an incredibly flawed strategy mm -hmm. and actually make the situation worse. So why would you support a no-fly zone or something like that, until we get a solid voice from the opposition in Syria that clearly and routinely forswears behavior that is antithetical to democracy or Western values. That is a major problem there and why we don't support some of these groups. They don't clearly forswear some of the very things that we're worried about, we may in fact be feeding tomorrow's lion coming at us. Sure, uh, I think it's a good point. Uh, I, I think the reason why we still need to do it is because if we let Putin uh, continue doing what he's doing in Syria, he's not going to, you know, to put it, to flip the argument another way, you could say, well, why not just let Putin take care of things, right? Why not just let him take care of it and go, out, go try to go at Raqqa? Uh, I think the problem is Putin doesn't have the resources to stabilize Syria. Uh, neither the manpower uh, nor the financial resources. He's not going to invest in any kind of reconstruction. Um, and I think his continual presence is going to keep the conflict going. And it's going to hemorrhage refugees um, it, it's going to help ISIS grow. It, 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 his presence is not a stabilizing presence. That, that's the summit. If Putin, look, if Putin really uh, was willing to, uh, to put his weight behind reconstruction and play a positive role, let's say if he really was going after ISIS, uh, then we could talk about a co -op and let him let him help us. The, 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 the problem is that that's not what he's been doing. And his presence alone is destabilizing Syria. And uh, what's happening in Syria, as you can see, it never stays in Syria. It affects the entire region, and it affects other regions as well. That, that's, that's my answer. What's your second question? Um, the second one was, um, as far as I understand it, there's about three major sovereign wealth funds that Russia draws from. They have been drawing those down at a precipitous rate. Oil is going to maybe plateau in the 60 mm -hmm. to 70 range, probably more like 60. As I understand it, oil is not profitable in Russia until you're talking about $110 a barrel. So the small rise relative to what it costs them and their infrastructure continues to deteriorate, uh, I, I don't see how Putin becomes a major threat when he's burning through his reserves at, at such a rapid rate. I think by 2018, they're supposed to be all exhausted. So, you know, talks about resurgent military and creating problems here and there. Honestly, I don't see it because they don't have the finances to do it. Um, so. I think the big question many Russian analysts have is where has, been, where has Putin been getting his resources up till now? Uh, to be able to do everything he's done. And I don't think most of us have a very clear answer. Um, but the fact of the matter is uh, he has been very successful up till now and he has been able to come up, come up with the resources. Right, but those are about to be extinguished. You're, so you're saying that now, but people have been saying that for years. And so far it hasn't happened. 
And um, I, I think, again, we tend to underestimate him. I, I'm not saying we should you know, be afraid of him and think that he's 10 feet tall, that he's all powerful, none of that at all. But, but we haven't taken um, in, enough of an analytical look at what's, what's happening. And, and he, I mean, this is why IMF predicts growth. It, 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 oh. I, I would only push back on one thing that, you know, we've been saying this for years. I don't think that's been true. I think we've been saying it maybe since early 2015 or late 2014, because prior to that, oil was in the 105 to 110, i.e., steady state for the Russians. But in the last three years, it has fallen off a cliff. And if the projections are right, those sovereign wealth, one's already gone, another is almost gone, and the third one will be gone by 2018. So I don't think we've been talking about it too long, and I think very quickly we're going to see him show up with no clothes on one day because there's nothing left to burn through unless he's willing to start selling parcels of Russia and its uh, you know, infrastructure yeah. to the highest bidder, which he may in fact be willing to do. I hope you're right. Uh, I hope you're right, but I... Um you know, to push back a little bit also, uh, some Russian analysts uh, have been saying that a collapse will come, not just in 2015. They started saying it uh, in the mid to late uh, uh, 2000s. So this, uh, um, this is not as new as it might seem. Uh, again, look, I, I hope you're right, uh, but I, I don't see it happening just yet. Because even if you go to Russia right now, um, uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg are still still pretty functional. They feel... They feel the, the sanctions, they feel the decline, but they're not, they're not collapsing. And I also think this, uh, many people, uh, if you don't know Russia, they discount the, um, the, the, the threshold uh, that the Russian people have for hardship. It is much lower, far lower than anything anyone in the West would tolerate. Nobody, uh, no Westerner would tolerate the living of standards uh, in Russia right now. But, uh, but Russian citizens are still satisfied. And, and, you know, and to go back even further, uh, Russian citizens have not lived as well in, at any point in their history uh, as they have under Putin. And even with the current decline, the living standards are still higher than anything they've experienced. Uh, so they can take a lot of pain. Yes, Gus, please. I don't want to seem more callous than I already am, but why, <laughs> you know, I think we're wasting our time on the Syria discussion. It, it's all but over, uh, and I'm sorry for all the bad things that have happened and the loss of life. The hemorrhaging that we talk about of, of uh, refugees is stymied and will continue to just kind of trickle. Where are other places that we can look to develop? And, and it's too late. We're too late in the game, right? Uh, we blew it. We blew it for a long time. Where are other places that we, as the United States, can look to develop a counter-Russian strategy now that isn't Libya or Syria or Georgia or Ukraine? Hmm. Okay. Well, I disagree with you a little bit on Syria, and that's because um, what happens, what, what's going to happen in Syria is going to continue to matter for us because as long as Assad is in Damascus or someone from his family or some, somebody from that circle, most refugees are not going to want to come back. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a conflict that's going to, whatever happens is going to keep affecting regional dynamics. So that's, that's just, it's just a quick comment. Um, and uh, in terms of other areas, I mean, I, I still think Libya is important. The Mediterranean is important. The Caucasus is a very important region that we don't pay enough attention to, North and South Caucasus, because I think that they're part of that same arc. Uh, a lot of uh, Putin's deliveries to Syria have been through the Caucasus. We haven't been paying enough attention to that region. Um, we certainly are looking at Ukraine uh, and, uh, and the Balkans, but I think we need to uh, keep paying attention to that as well. But, so the Caucasus is, is another place. Well, I, nothing in Latin America, nothing in Africa, nothing in kind of further parts of, of East Asia, uh, or I even the South Pacific? I don't know enough about these regions. I know Russia has, uh, Putin has strong connections to Venezuela. Um, and that's something else to watch. I simply, uh, by virtue of being just one person, <laughs> uh, that I can't look at everything, so I, I don't know enough. Uh, I will say that, again, the Far East, Russia's Far East, is important to watch also. Uh, and maybe Cuba. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Mark, please. 
I want first a quick comment, then a question. Uh, certainly going back to your to the discussion about how much can the Russians put up with and, and when will they run out. I, I was struck by reading a story about Irkutsk the other day where quite a number of alcohol poisonings had taken mm -hmm. place. And the people, the other upset is just awful. Our life sucks out here. But they literally, one was quoted as saying, we still need a czar and Putin's the good czar. It's kind of sort of this classic Russian view of, well, it's not the czar's fault. It's the advisors and all these other factors around him. And I think that'll, that'll add to Putin's staying power. Uh, my question kind of ties to, to Syria and Libya. You, you had mentioned, we talked about refugees quite a bit, and, and certainly the impact it's having in Western Europe. I, I've seen, I think, at least two analysts who have speculated that perhaps it's a very conscious strategy mm -hmm. by Putin to, to keep these, to keep mm -hmm. the conflict in Syria going, mm -hmm. to keep the refugee flowing, mm -hmm. going. And one of the concerns with his sudden interest in Libya is, is, is that another move to try to to, to weaponize, if you will, a refugee flow to, to inflict more pain on the West. Do you see that as being a, a possible explanation? I, I think it's one possible. I mean, I, it certainly would be consistent with, with his thinking. Yeah. Yes, yes sir, please. Uh, first uh, is, you mentioned about like a six, probably like objectives of Russians that they got from the Syria campaign. Mm -hmm. And you emphasize that Russia didn't def uh, defeat any ISIS. Uh, then whom Russia defeat? Like who was there like a uh, enemy or is it, is it like uh, the Jabhat al-Nusra as it mentioned in there like a policies or Kurds, who can they be? And the second question, Going back to the Russian Iran, like a Turkey Trinity, like a, uh, how do you assess the future of the Turkish uh, membership in the NATO? Because in uh, July they had the military coup attempt. Right. Uh, in the Russian media, there were some good articles, high-rated articles regarding the three ships, Russian ships uh, of military intelligence in a. Uh, uh, coastal regions of Turkey. One was in Marmaris. It was e uh, electronic warfare, which was protecting the Erdogan's flight during the three hours right after he uh, landed from the Marmaris. And another two submarines was waiting in Istanbul, where uh, Erdogan landed right after he uh, like uh, that hours. And but here in the Western countries, it hasn't been mentioned in my judgment. It's uh, important, and right before the military uh, coup attempt, three countries, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, in Baku discussed, uh, they had their kind of meetings in a high-level uh, diplomats, and first visit of Erdogan right after July incident, uh, like a military coup attempt, was St. Petersburg, and he went there with his huge uh, group of generals, high-level generals, uh, including the uh, chief of general staff, etc. And uh, so what will be the further Russian like uh, strategies in Middle East or even like in a possible Libya campaign uh, with uh, changing some kind of an Turkish foreign uh, security policies? Okay. All right, so, okay, so the first part of your question was, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, NATO and Turkey, and then your first, the first, what was your first question? I'm sorry. Like uh, Russia, who was defeated by Russian? Oh, forces? who was it? Right, right. Right, right. 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 So, so, um, so in terms of Russian airstrikes, who have they targeted in Syria if it wasn't ISIS? It wasn't so much Jabhat and Nusra either. It was mostly, and it was basically all other armed opposition to Assad, which included groups uh, that the United States uh, supported and in this sense, and you know, and this is why, um, uh, you know, you know. First, don't forget that it was Assad uh, who helped uh, ISIS rise in uh, Syria in the first place when he opened uh, the notorious Sinaia prison that uh, contained a number of, of jihadists. And Assad remains one of the largest sources of recruitment for jihadists uh, because it's Assad's abuses also that help people radicalize. So to answer your question, it was basically everybody else. Uh, and um, uh, in terms of, um, and, and, and by the very virtue of supporting Assad, 
Putin is helping ISIS because ISIS remains one of the biggest sources of recruitment for them. Um, and in terms of Turkey and, um, and NATO, I, I think that's a good question. I, I, um, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. I, I mean, all I see is, um, is Erdogan falling more into Putin's camp. Uh, and, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see how this plays out. NATO is a consensus-driven uh, organization. You can't expel members. Uh, I mean, basically, Turkey would have to vote itself out. Uh, I think that's the only way they can leave NATO, if I understand correctly. Did you answer your question, sir? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions, comments? Been so many questions so far. Tons of questions are really impressive, right? Yeah. So because... Oh, yes, please. We keep going. We keep going. That's great. <laughs> So I have a question about the, uh, Russia's uh, near abroad. With the uh, passing of uh, some of the old line leaders to go back to the Soviet era, President Karamov of Uzbekistan, for example, um, how do you see that relationship evolving with, with uh, newer generations of leaders in those countries? Uh, to the extent that I can speak about it in an educated way, because again, I haven't followed all of these uh, relationships. Uh, I, I see it evolving quite well, <laughs> uh, in a nutshell, uh, because I think that um, uh, Central Asian leaders uh, um, recognize that they need Putin, and uh, they, they share many qualities uh, in terms of their personalities and so forth. So I, I, think, I, I, I think it's evolving well on a number of fronts. Again, Kazakhstan, I think, uh, again, Kazakhstan always tries to diversify away from the Kremlin. But being a prominent member of Customs Union, I don't think they're, uh, I, I don't think they're able to, to do that just yet. I mean, there's certainly, it, it's, not a, uh, uh, it's not all love and admiration, but, it's quite, but Putin always makes it clear that there is ethnic Russian minorities in Kazakhstan and he can try to play them. And they're right next door. And they're right next door, exactly. Questions, comments? Outstations? That's a chance for you to chime in. Okay, I think that's a good time to stop here, right? That's what we exactly planned. And thank you again. I want to thank, on behalf of all of you, Ms. Borshevska for a great presentation. Thank you very much. And I want to pass the floor to Colonel Penfield for the final remarks. No, that was quick. Okay, so you can come up on your real quick here. Okay. So one, we, we very much appreciate you coming in and providing the insights that from your uh, background, historically as well as coming in your profession, that you're able to give us a perspective not always known to us particularly. And so as we come into our discussions here, we have a West, you know, a different kind of mindset in some cases that we, we don't look at all the, the different angles So because it's a very complex situation out there. And even in your case, you can't yeah. foresee the future because yeah. it's the future, right? And so, you know, we can look at different conditions and see them completely different. But if we don't have that kind of dialogue and discussion, that's what helps us formulate a more cohesive and coherent strategy vice a strategy. And that may, you know, again, kind of like our optimization of our military, when you look at full spectrum, you can't optimize exactly how you need to be. You just don't want to get it too badly wrong. Policy is along the same lines, because that's in strategy, same thing. So your insights today help us to shape our thought along that line. So on behalf of Major General Kim, who is the Deputy Commanding General and the Provost for Army University, uh, the coin for you for both your on you. with our thanks for your presentation thank you. today. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much, Ms. Koshenska. If I may, real quick, for your information, in about a week from today, uh, the video and all related uh, materials will be placed on this website right here. You can see the website. So you can access it under its public domain, unclassified, under conferences, forums, seminars. If you want to go through that again, through entire video session, or the, hopefully will be publications, and we, we disseminated the talking points prior to, to the session, right? You have that as well. So if we have anything else, we'll post there as well. And thank you again for joining us today. Until the next time.